Very special edition of Kibbe on Liberty. We are talking with my favorite, maybe one of my two favorite congressmen, Thomas Massey from Kentucky. We're going to pick apart AOC's Green New Deal. We're going to talk about defending the Constitution even when your guy is in power. And of course, we're going to talk about libertarian robots. Join us now. So we're, we're going to start with this, this this origin story. I think I've I think I've unearthed news about Thomas Massey. Um, I think everybody watching this and listening, they know Thomas Massey is this is this curmudgeonly awesome Liberty congressman. But I never knew what the origin story. You always said the Second Amendment, but you're you're telling me about these uh, children's books you read as a kid. Um, Tell me that story, because I think it's it's not so di- dissimilar from my, my, my thing. I feel like you're my shrink, and we're going back into my childhood to figure out what's wrong with me. Well, that's it, yeah, it's going to get weird after a while. <laughs> well, um, I do remember the first sort of libertarian reading that I can remember was a uh, trilogy of books that I got hooked on in the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. And it's, it's a series called The Tripods by John Christopher. I think he's a British writer. And it's about these, it's sort of like a Matrix almost m- movie before The Matrix. Yeah. These aliens in, invade the Earth. They take over the planet. They subjugate the humans. They're really pretty weak creatures themselves, but they have these exoskeletons that are about the size of a water tower, and they, but their legs are articulated. So they're like walking water towers, and they've taken over the planet. And what they, they, they need the humans to help them, just like in The Matrix. I think The Matrix totally ripped this book off now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah. And what the, uh, this is the key part here. What the aliens do to every human at the age of sort of consciousness, when you start to question things, which I think in the book is about 12 or 13, which was the age I was reading these books, yeah. right? Is they put a cap on on the human, and it's, it's like something that uh, attaches to the scalp just under the hair. It's not real noticeable. But w- one of the... Uh, heroes, I guess, in the story. And, and the cap controls your mind. That's basically. right. Yeah. Whenever you get these impulses to question things, yeah. it sort of deadens your curiosity. And so, Like a congressional pen. Maybe. Right, yeah, yeah, or the Federal Department of Education. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so anyways, uh, one of the kids gets a faulty install. The cap doesn't work, right? And so through the, through the grace of the alien's like mistake which uh, this kid starts having independent thought. And he, and he looks around and he, sa- and he says, this is messed up. I mean, we're, we're just a bunch of humans sucking up to these aliens. Yeah. This is really screwed up. And then the whole story is about sort of his personal uh, journey to try to undermine these aliens and to wake people up, to bring them to consciousness, maybe to bring them to liberty. What I thought was so cool about that story is that my my liberty origin story is actually quite similar. Um, and you know, I, I was a I turned into a huge Ayn Rand guy when I was a kid. But the gateway was was an album by by Rush called Twenty One Twelve, and uh, the the song uh, cycle of Twenty One Twelve is a total ripoff of of Rand's anthem that that little futuristic book uh-huh. and it's it's like this sci-fi story about about the the priests in the temple in this this future world in the middle of nowhere that that want to dictate from the top down you know everything that that you love and like and and some poor guy discovers a guitar and they tell him no we can't do that because it's not good for the people and it's a total ripoff of, of Rand's anthem, which in and of itself is like a science fiction story about about some guy that that realizes that he's not the collective, he's an individual. Right. And he, and he starts acting up. You know, another movie I think that ripped off this tripod series uh, is is The Hunger Games, 
because yeah. in this yeah. tripod series, what they did is they had um, these Olympics, and in every sort of region, the young, the young athletic individuals would qualify, and then they would win their Olympics, and they would go to the capital city of the aliens. And so the, the kid who came to consciousness, he had to win this Olympic thing so he could go to the capital city, which is where all the action was, where yeah, the top-down management was coming from. And it's I, totally I get, Hunger Games. Yeah, It is Hunger Games. Maybe it's my election to Congress, though, right? I'm yeah. a nerd, and I had to win this congressional <laughs> race to come to the capital city. And these are much like aliens here. You know, it's, it's funny, like science fiction in particular, but... Uh, a lot of narratives in popular culture are sort of instinctually libertarian, sort of anti-authoritarian. Um, I want to think for myself kind of stuff. The Hunger Games is a great example of that. And yet, you know, here in, inside the Beltway, it's a very different thing. There's a, there's a, there's a group think that How is it that, that Hollywood is so liberal and they end up making some of these uh, libertarian type anthems, if you will, that inspire yeah. libertarians I, I think it's a disconnect I, th I think I think I think they don't see the the, 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 the fundamental relationship between individual liberty and, and and thinking for yourself and and artistic integrity and and these are things that are I hope still attractive in Hollywood but how it fits into an economic system and how it is that that free people might choose to create a product instead of a song or a product instead of a, a movie um, there's that disconnect. And, and in Hollywood, um, to the extent that they're willing to say Ayn Rand was okay, it's more the fountainhead, which was about an architect who was creative and, and it was all about artistic creativity. If you're building a railroad, they, they find that a little, a little gauche. It's not but, cool. By the way, I have to make a confession here. Yeah. About oh, this is, this is going to be a bombshell. Oh, I did not. I did not read Atlas Shrugged. I've actually never read the whole thing, but let me explain <laughs> before you convict me and, and call me a heretic. Um, I tried reading Atlas Shrugged like three times. I felt that I was probably had these inklings and people who met me said, you need to read Atlas Shrugged. And I got to the middle of the book and it was just so painful. I am sorry. She could have like, cut, cut that book in half, okay? Just take out the whole third, the middle third. But I couldn't get through the middle third. My wife read it and loved it, but was convinced I would like it even more. So she bought me Atlas Shrugged books on tape. And I was able to make it through the middle of the book. I'm, I'm just offering this for other people who think they might be libertarian who just choked on well, Atlas a, a couple of these guys have failed the test as well so okay so well you're not alone well here's how i overcame it my wife bought me books on tape i got through the middle third by listening to it in the car it got interesting again and um i picked up the book and and read the last third you know what what i will say about that book and i i have i'm a weird guy i've read it probably six times but over a um 45-year period, so it's it's not that weird. But what's amazing to me about it, uh, more than anything else, is it's, it's really a, a disposition of basic public choice theory, how how it is that businesses are corrupted by big government and that, that deal, that offer that you can't refuse is made to corporations um, who eventually, in the book, send a man to Washington. And it's the collusion between politics and business, and and as much as anything, the heroes in Atlas Shrugged are fighting against that 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 dirty collusion. Um, she got public choice theory before public choice theory was even a thing. Mm -hmm. But but you, of course, didn't make it through the book. I want to I want to admit something else too. Uh oh. Okay, all these. By the way, your staff's <laughs> freaking out. Like you're you're really emptying your closet. My at this staff's point. going to be okay. Um, Am I going to be okay? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you may know this next part, too. All these Austrian economics, e economists. Yeah. Uh, I never read a single one of their books before I ran for Congress. Oh, my gosh. Uh, but let me tell you. Now, I th I, give me a chance at redemption. <laughs> I, uh, I did take economics as my humanities 
class at MIT. So <laughs> this is kind of funny. At MIT, uh, every you have to take you're there eight semesters to graduate in four years, which I did my undergrad. Uh, you have to take eight humanities classes and, and you have to concentrate in an area. And I said, you know what? I hate writing papers on like, you know, English literature or whatever. Let me find a humanities where I can do a problem set instead of a paper. And so the, the economics fit, fit the bill. So I took intro to micro at MIT and they have some great economics professors. I loved it. It's, it's like, it explains human behavior with mathematics, which for me as a nerd who was struggling to understand, you know, human behavior uh, better um, and understood mathematics completely, microeconomics was a key. Uh, it, it explains your preferences and why you do certain things, and it really does match up to mathematical modeling, and you can predict things. Then I took macroeconomics. Intro to macroeconomics. This was in like 1991, I want to say. And my professor was Paul Krugman. He was oh. an associate professor at MIT. Hadn't won the Nobel Prize thingy yet. Um, they, they, people tell me he actually wasn't that bad back then, but I kind of disagree because... He was a good trade economist, and that, that's what all, my, all of my smart economist friends say. But that was, um, I suspect he wasn't as loony as he is today. It was it was a difficult three or four months that semester. Yeah, and I I remember going to the front of the class. It was a large lecture hall, and at the end of the class, going up there and saying, "This doesn't make sense. Could you explain it a little more?" You wrote some equations and some Greek symbols, but I how do you solve these? Right. And he and I remember him saying, "Well, here." we believe this, and in Chicago, they believe this. And I'm like, no, you wrote mathematical equations. This is not a belief system. This, this should be either explainable logically, or it can be a belief, but it, you know. And so, anyways, that's when I decided I was not a big macroeconomics fan, at least not the way it was taught there. And so then I took micro after that to finish my concentration in economics without writing a paper for humanities class. Um, and so that's the story. That's my economics background. I, you know, I took three semesters at MIT. I did not read the books that everybody talks about. So you, you haven't, have, have you ever delved into any, any basic Austrian stuff? Well, basic what does basic mean um i read uh road to serfdom i think i got three quarters of the way through that and there, I, there I, are no equations in that book. there are no equations like this is not economics it's another it's a belief system okay i think it's more powerful when you can have a proof like a, a mathematical proof and um hayek is spinning in his grave right yeah, now. yeah well Yes. I'm sorry. He, he had, I don't know, I would get, maybe I'll get in trouble for this too, but I felt there were some social, socialist tendencies in that book too. Wow. Okay. Um, so, so. I'm sorry. I'm just telling it like, no, like, I like this is, it. this is brutal. We're, we're going to have to bleep some of this out because I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit triggered, but let's go back to picking on Krugman for a second. Cause the, the, the one thing that I thought the, and I, and I was, I was reading all of those books when I was a kid, uh, Mises and Hayek and, and all the guys that, that our, our, our dear mentor, Ron Paul, would tell us we should have read. You obviously weren't paying attention that day in class. But, you know, the critique of Austrian economics is that, it, it, first of all, it, Paul Krugman never told me to read Mises. Well, I'm shocked. <laughs> That's why you should have read he Mises. He talked about this thing called Chicago. Yeah, <clears throat> and what they believed there, but the, the you know there were there were two things that that Hayek would say to Paul Krugman if he was still here, and one is that you know the the problem with macroeconomics is it it pretends like uh, people aren't individuals and it tries to aggregate the entire behavior of an economic system, which is all these various peoples with different different preferences and thoughts. Um, but but the other problem which is a nice segue to, to what you do for a living, is that macroeconomics assumes that 
people that enter public service. You get elected to Congress, you become the head, the, the head of the Department of Education. All of these guys that work here inside the Beltway bubble somehow leave aside their, their self-interest when, they, when, they, when it comes to public policy. So you can, you can give all that power and money and control to the, the smart people with the congressional pins because they've put aside their self-interest and now they just care about the public interest. And that's why, that's, to me, that's why macroeconomics is silly because that, that is impossible. It's not true. It never has been. It never, it never will be. Do you, do you think that, that Washington, D.C. cares more about people than they care themselves? That's a softball, by the way. It's, it's evolved. It's an organism. Like, uh, it doesn't really have a brain as, as, as much as it has response to input stimuli that have been hard-coded into its neural system. Uh, like a blob it's a blob but it has it it reacts and it knows how to protect itself and it knows how to grow Uh, the scary thing about keynesian is though keynesian economics is that there's a part of it that works the part that says we can spend money now that we don't have to stimulate the economy that part works like taking your kids money before they even see it and, and having a party with it that works. And that's what's going on in DC, right? Like I'm not saying it's all BS what I learned in Paul Krugman's class at, at MIT. I'm saying the scary thing is it works the part where you spend your children's future to have a, a better present and that's what we've been doing. So that part of it, like I agree with him, that part works. Yeah, it, and it's such it's a hard. Why we have twenty-two trillion dollars of debt. Well, I noticed you you took Precious off. Yeah. To to do this to, to do this. Precious interview. is my congressional pin. Let's and see, it's in my pocket here. The reason, well, I always keep it in my pocket, just like any good Hobbit who has Precious. You can't give it up, and you might need it, and it gives you some comfort to reach in there and touch it. So I've got Precious here, and uh, the reason, I actually had to put Precious on today. It's dangerous to wear Precious, but uh, I I had uh, somebody from the district who I consider a VIP, who I wanted to give a good tour of the Capitol to, and um, I, I wanted to take him out on the Speaker's Lobby. Well, that used to be Paul Ryan's office, now it's Nancy Pelosi's office. So I had to, not only was I going into the heart of Mordor, I was going into the, the Nancy Pelosi's office. And, and I will have to admit her staff. But you repeat yourself. That's right. <laughs> her staff is kind and gracious, and, and they let me out on the speaker's balcony with my guest. But I felt like I had to have Precious on, on my uh, collar here in order to be safe in that spot. And it worked. And I and actually, I kind of liked wearing Precious, and I forgot to take it off. Or maybe I didn't forget to take it off, and I wore it a little longer than I had to for a couple hours after that. So um, as I recall, Frodo, it, it took about an hour of detox after, after taking the ring off in order to become his, 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 his moral balanced self. How long does it take? It depends for the on haze how, of power to... It depends on how long you've worn it. I mean, if you wear it continuously for a few days, it's going to take more than an hour of detox. Yeah. But if you put it on just to like go to special areas or to go to the Senate side, because the Capitol Hill police over there, if you're wearing a precious, they'll step aside and there's no question about your credentials. Um, but if you wear it like all day like all week it's going to take a long time to detox yeah and and you see that happen with your colleagues i mean i've seen it time and time again some of them are golem there's no detoxing for them like (laughs) they're they're in a cave there's no rehabilitation no they're eating fish with their hands guts and all (laughs) Uh, and so what omnibus bills 
So let's 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 talk about some sad things um, because I've. <laughs> I thought we were talking about Congress. Well, it's it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse Ooh. because it sad. it's sort of depressing to acknowledge that on on some things that that I think are are fundamental to to our values of liberty. You know, fiscal responsibility is one of them. And I can't remember the last time we went through a normal budget process. And I'm, I'm older than you are, and I've unfortunately been in this town longer than you have. And, and I just don't remember when we ever went through regular order and, and, and introduced a bill that would actually go through reconciliation and balance. It used to be five years, and then it was 10, and now they don't balance at all. Like, what happened to the fiscal conservatives? I, um, you know, sometimes I want to blame my colleagues. But the longer I've been here, I'm ready to blame their constituents. Um, uh, to uh, quote uh, Heinlein, the science fiction author, and I'm, and I'm just paraphrasing, but uh, people will vote for breads and circuses until the day the breads and circuses end, until the empire is, is destroyed. Uh, but there's another layer to that. We have a republic, so they can't vote themselves breads and circuses. So they vote for the people who promise to vote for breads and circuses. And, and that's what we have right now. So as much as I want to fault my colleagues... If you're watching this show, you're probably not part of the problem. Yeah. But your neighbor probably is because <laughs> they sent somebody here who keeps voting for omnibus bills. Like, by the way, the omnibus bill, it doesn't follow any sort of process. This last one was horrible. Like, they just had like four people in a room. They didn't even pretend to have a process this last time. So I think we're not just beyond the process. We're beyond pretending to have a process. At least under John Boehner, we would mark up stuff in committee and we'd bring it to the floor and we'd pass separate appropriations bills and I could offer amendments on the floor and I got some votes and sometimes I prevailed. And, and ultimately, they would take all that work product and throw it in the trash and go behind the doors and write their own version. But at least we that kept us busy, and, and it felt like we had a process, but now we, we're not even doing that. Uh, under Paul Ryan, we didn't do that. It'll be interesting. He, Paul Ryan, by the way, d- quit allowing amendments on appropriations bills, even the amendments that cut spending or don't increase spending. He just and that were germane to the bill. He just quit allowing them. And so now I, it's going to be interesting under Nancy Pelosi if they're going to keep up the pretense of a, of a process or if we're now permanently resigned to saying four people and the president are going to be in a room and decide how the money gets spent and then we all get to vote. We all get five hours to read thousand or two thousand pages and vote yay or nay and that's that's how this last one just happened the democrats by the way i gotta tell you this quick story so under pelosi she said you gotta back uh the the old pelosi the previous pelosi you gotta vote for the bill to see what's in it okay she's famous for that republicans took the majority in 2010 said that's crap we're gonna have a three-day rule you're going to have three days to read every bill. That sounded wonderful. And then they, they decided that was such a burden to have to, to require three days to pass any bill. So they decided that the first day counts if you introduce the bill at 11.50 p.m. So 10 minutes of one day counts as a whole day. And then you would have, uh, let's say they do that on Monday night, right before midnight. That counts as a day. Tuesday you know, it stews for a day. You've got one day to read it, and then we'll vote on it Wednesday morning. So the three-day rule became a 36-hour rule. And we we tried within our conference to offer uh, amendments to the rules, every, you know, when, when Congress restarted, to make it a 72-hour rule. We never prevailed. The, the Republicans always talked us out of it or stopped it. Well, the Democrats came into power, and the Democrats said, we're better than that. 
we're going to have a 72-hour rule. Honest to goodness, you got to have 72 hours, not a second less, between the introduction of the bill and the passage of the bill. Well, last week they suspended their 72-hour rule. It only takes a majority vote of Congress to suspend the rules, and all the Democrats who were gung-ho to have a 72-hour rule just suspended it, threw it out the window, and we had about five hours to read the last bill. It lasted six weeks, their new set of rules that, for the two-year Congress. So, and it spirals out of control, but I, I think there's, there's something to be said, and I'm, maybe I'm romanticizing uh, older Congresses, <laughs> but, but there's, <laughs> there's something to be said that, like, once the Republicans do it, um, and, and they, then they break their promise— it makes it that much easier for Nancy Pelosi to do it. It was like it was sort of like a pretend thing, and she never intended to keep that rule. and And you get that constant erosion of of not not constitutional limits on on congressional behavior, but just the the accepted rules of the game. Because there was there was a time not that long ago when regular order was was a thing, and and right. minorities had voices within the even in the House of Representatives. And it's just all gone now. There, there's none of that, um, and and those weren't formal like constitutional rules. It's just like that's the way we do things, and now the way we do things is is completely corrupt. Right. The, but the, we were still going on the budget law that passed in the '70s that prescribed how Congress would pass a budget and then do the appropriations bills. It seems like we've completely abandoned that, and it does happen incrementally through erosion, which um, gets me to a vote that I took tonight that I would like to explain if I can. Yeah, big vote, big vote on on emergency powers and whether or not Trump can, what I would, I'll, I'll, I'll characterize it and then you can correct me. <laughs> okay. Trump wanted to self-appropriate to build the wall, having failed to get both Republican Congresses and Democrat a Democrat Congress to approve that funding. Correct. Uh, that's that's a pretty good, I would say, reappropriate because he wasn't creating money out of thin air. Yeah. He wanted to take money that we said spend on X and he wanted to spend it on Y. But and and that was what we had the vote on tonight was a resolution that the Democrats introduced. And by the way, this will come up in the Senate because it has privileged status. It doesn't have to meet sixty vote threshold to to end debate, because the uh, the president declared a national emergency, and he said, because I've declared a national emergency, now I can reappropriate this money within the military to build a wall. And so in the House tonight, we had a vote on a resolution that said, no, you can't. And the uh, National Emergencies Act, which the president is following, like he's following a loophole that Congress created, right? So we, we can't blame him or his lawyers for finding this loophole. Right. They found it. Right. They stretched, I'm going to say they stretched very far the definition of emergency. Yeah. Uh, and, and now we're following that process and saying, we don't agree with you, and so we're going to rescind that national emergency declaration. And I, I voted to rescind that national emergency declaration, even though I believe we should have a more secure border. Um, you, can't, you can't have open borders in a welfare state, which is what we have right now. And um, so anyways, I voted with the Democrats today, tonight. There were 12 Republicans who did, but I think I'm in the most conservative district of the 12 who voted for that. So it's a dangerous vote for me to take, but I'm hoping that my constituents after six years understand that I'm consistent and I'm principled and I have complained, uh, I complained for the four years Obama was in office about him using his pen and his phone to try and circumvent Congress to start wars to uh, change health care laws, to change immigration laws, to implement gun control. On all of these issues, Obama sought to circumvent Congress because he knew he couldn't get Congress to pass it after 2010. In, in my opinion, and this will make some people mad, 
That is what President Trump is doing now. He's trying to circumvent Congress. It is not a national emergency. When you sign, as the president, you sign four or five bills that don't have what you want in it. And then when you sign the last bill that doesn't have what you want in it to declare an emergency because the bill doesn't have what you want in it, that is not an emergency. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. So one of the uh, constitutional lawyers that, that I deeply respect, uh, a guy named Bruce Fine, maybe, maybe you've read I his know stuff. Bruce. Good guy. Um, and he looked at, and, and you know, the counter argument to you is uh, uh, presidents have been declaring national emergencies. I forget what the number is. It's like 29 mm-hmm. since the, the 76 law mm-hmm. that, that we're debating here. But he argues that what, what Trump did in, in terms of just abuse of executive power goes further. It, it's, it's more egregious than any of the others because it, it comes very close, and, and Bruce would say it crosses a line in terms of, of the executive branch um, uh, violating the power of the purse. And you know, the one thing that we all, all, of, all of us constitutionalists talk about is the one way that Congress can stop a president that's gone off the rails is the power of the purse. We can we can not fund certain things, <laughs> um, and this this applies to to war powers in particular, I yeah. think. And and so to me, uh, the the principle here is not yes, Obama did it, and yes, Bush did it, and and yes, there's been abuses under the '76 Act since day one. But this one's this one's different. It's a little bit worse. Uh, I had breakfast with Justice Scalia once. There were about a dozen of us congressmen, Republicans, who invited him over. And um, Steve King invited him to speak on the topic of restoring constitutional balance of government. And uh, we had a, a very nice breakfast at the Capitol Hill Club. Scalia puts down his, his fork and his knife, and he picks up the flyer for the, the breakfast Restoring constitutional balance of government. He reads it. He drops it. He says, this is not my job. I'm not speaking to this. This You have all, and he looks at every member of Congress in the room and says, you have all the power you need to do this yourself. Don't ask me to do it. And one of my colleagues protested, but, 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 Justice Scalia, with all due respect, the power of impeachment is so unwieldy. It's politically impractical to deploy. And Scalia scoffed. Why? I am not talking about the power of impeachment. I'm talking about the power of the purse. Everything you guys complain about, you fund. All you've got to do is stop the funding. And so it is. It is the, the most sacrosanct power of Congress, and to the extent that previous Congresses, before I got here, created that National Emergencies Act, to the extent that they have given the president uh, flexibility in reappropriating money, they did so recklessly and at the risk of taking apart this republic and replacing it with a king. Now, let me bound these conditions, okay? The president is, is reappropriating like 3 or $4 billion of a $4 trillion budget. This is 0.1%. Right. These aren't my words, but some of my colleagues would call that budget dust. Yeah. Okay. He swept up some budget dust. In Washington, that's nothing. He's, it's, that's in our couch cushions, right? Yeah. The lobbyists, that falls out of their pockets in the cushions in our couches when they come to visit us. But he swept up that budget dust. He, he packed it into something, and he says, here's my wall. Okay, here's the other thing about his, that, that sort of bounds his reappropriation. He's taking 2019 appropriations, and he's reappropriating them in 2019. On September 30th, 2019, the 2019 fiscal year ends and the 2020 fiscal year begins. Nancy Pelosi has the gavel. She will have the gavel on that day. The bill will say none of the money hereby appropriated shall be reappropriated for a wall. So even 
if Trump prevails in this emergency declaration and reappropriates this money, he's got till September 30th to spend it. And, and after that, there's, this is like a one trick pony and it's only happens one time. It's like, Matt, let's say your parents gave you lunch money and said, go buy lunch at the school cafeteria this week. And they give you a week of lunch money and you, and you go to McDonald's and, and buy your lunch. And the next week, they're just going to give the money straight to the cafeteria. They're not going to trust you with the money. So this trick he's using only works once. It's one-tenth of one percent of the budget. It's a minor erosion, but to me, that's how we lose this republic, is one tiny uh, incremental step at a time. The calculus of it, right, as a math geek. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the calculus of this does not work. We eventually lose the whole republic if we cede these new precedents to the president. And it is, Bruce Fine is right. This is a new precedent. The day, the day the president signed the bill that didn't have what he wanted in it, he said, this is an emergency. I just signed a bill that didn't have enough money for what I want, so I'm declaring an emergency. So I've had this argument with my friends on Facebook, and, and by the way, I 100% agree with you. And, and it's almost more aggravating to me that it, it was about budget dust. It's not. This is not like a big amount of money that we're, I don't know, even know if that's proper English, but I'll use it anyway. It's not a lot of money. And so, so to, to erode that precedent, and, and particularly when it comes to the power of the purse, my, my argument is someday your president will not be president anymore. Someday, God help us, someone like Camilla Harris might be president. Anything can happen. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, fill in the blank with your worst freaking nightmare. Um, won't she be empowered to, to say, you know, Trump did that, so I'm, I'm going to double down, and, and I'm really going to, to erode the power of the purse because um, I, I want to, um, I don't know what she wants to do. Like she, well, you imagine don't have the worst to fill thing. in the blanks. Yeah. Don't fill in the blanks. Uh, Pelosi filled in the blank for you. She said they would do gun control. Yeah. Uh, so let, so it's let a Pelosi, national emergency, yeah, according that's to the Nancy problem. Pelosi. Yeah, a national emergency. People are dying in Chicago every day. Uh, you know. Green New Deal. According, according to Alexander Ocasio-Cortez, uh, we will all be dead in 12 years unless we implement her legislation. So, Matt, you've been to my house. You've seen the solar panels on my house. My house is off the grid. You are so green. I think I'm the greenest member of Congress, but I but I want I, I'm worried about this Green New Deal. Uh, nobody has told me yet if I like the solar panels I have that I can keep them. You know that at least we got that promise with Obamacare, and I'm hoping that because I like the solar panels I have, I could keep them under the Green New Deal. But I'm not sure because the other thing about this Green New Deal, if it works like Obamacare. You know, I, I did solar panels because they're cool. I could be independent. I'll tell you what, if Thomas Jefferson could have had solar panels at, at Monticello, he would have had solar panels at Monticello. He wouldn't have bought power from a government-regulated cooperative, okay? Right. I've been to Monticello. If he could have put them on there, that would have been on the roof. He collected his own rainwater, too, by the way. That would be a big no-no. So, you know, he was off the grid, so uh, I'm off the grid. Uh, I do it because I like it. It gives me independence. It unencumbers me from these uh, karmatic reprisals and externalities that I can't see at the end of the wire. Um, and so that's why I'm doing it. But uh, I'm worried about this Green New Deal because I do know that it costs about twice as much to make your power with solar panels. I think the way the Green New Deal is going to work, if it works like Obamacare, they will, if you can't afford solar panels, they will fine you until you can afford them. Right. That's the other part yeah. I think this Green New Deal is going to, other way that's going to work. They, they will make you green at any cost necessary. Oh, you've also seen my cattle, right? Yeah. I have some cows that are old enough to vote, okay? Uh, a brood cow can go 18 years and, and, and pop out a calf every year reliably like clockwork. 
And, you know, some, some ranchers would keep them a shorter period of time than that. But I get attached to my cows, so a lot of them get old enough to vote. <laughs> and the thing that scares my cattle about this Green New Deal is they've got a 10-year window, and right. they're all gone after that. Yeah, I don't know what happens in, in Cowageddon. Like, there's, there's some... We're going to be eating a lot of beef in that 10-year There's, to there's some permanent solution here that, that doesn't bode well for cattle. Or you, for those of us that, that love steak. You know, we had uh, 40 to 60 million buffalo on this continent when the white man arrived. And we've got uh, about that many cattle right now. So I think we're, we're uh, bovine flatulence neutral at this point. <laughs> well... We're having fun. I, I, I love the direction this, this conversation has taken because I, I, I want to selfless, uh, selfishly flack uh, the movie that we made with you uh, called Off the Grid with Thomas Massey. And, and you, you probably don't even know this part, but when we, when we had a, a, a semi-final cut of the movie, we showed it to some of our Bernie bro friends and, and you confounded them because because you were so green and reasonable and using uh, what, you, you didn't say it this way, but you're using basic economics to figure out how to be a good steward of your land, how to, how to produce a carbon, foot, carbon neutral footprint, um, and how to be energy independent, how to um, produce organic food. And, and these were all sort of, uh, um, bucolic progressive values that, that at least they talk about, right? Well, I, ha I have Democrat co-sponsors on my uh, raw milk bill and my Prime Act, which would make it easier for local farmers to sell to local consumers to sell beef and pork using a local processor. Uh, so yeah, some of them don't just talk to talk; they walk to walk, and yeah. they and they um, realize that. Uh, in this, at least in this instance, that big government is keeping good things from happening. Yeah, and that to me, we don't. I don't think we spend enough time. You know, you can, you we we can absolutely mock the new green deal. It's it's ridiculous. It's dangerous. It's probably detrimental to environmental progress. But we should talk more about how it is that 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 free people just sort of figure out innovative ways to to produce more while leaving a smaller footprint on the land. Um, I mean, that's, to me, that's, the word economics comes from, from economy, and economy mm -hmm. is about, is about uh, how you rationally allocate scarce resources, how you protect these, these things that are so precious. Well, um, you know, sustainability, right? Yeah. That's like uh, my hillbilly ancestors in Appalachia are probably the most sustainable you can imagine. I mean, my grandmother taught me how to can. And, and um, so, you know, you reuse the glass jar. The only thing, and you reuse the, the ring that goes on top of it. The only thing we had to replace, because we had evolved from the zinc lids that they had, that you can still find on my farm if you dig around. You can find zinc lids to these jars. But we used a, a disposable lid, and that's about it. And you could reuse those jars forever unless you dropped one and broke it. And so sustainable means frugal, yeah. which also is very close to independent. The, yeah. the less you have to go to the store and buy, the, the less dependent you are on Walmart— it doesn't turn out, it's not just that you're greener, but you're more independent. So in this Venn diagram, I see a lot of overlap. Uh, I drive a Tesla electric car. Okay, we, could, we can make all the power we want for those cars here in the United States using coal or natural gas or uh, solar power. And we would be, we wouldn't need to be involved in all these wars in the Middle East, which even a lot of conservatives admit it's about the price of oil and keeping it down. I mean, the president recently tweeted, like in the last day or two, "Hey, OPEC, take it down a notch. We yeah. want cheaper gas, yeah. right? Well, screw OPEC. Why are we even tweeting at OPEC? Screw them. 
Let's do it all here. And then we don't have those those encumbrances, those externalities, their karmatic reprisals. We don't have to be over there bombing people. Uh, we don't have to take sides. We don't have to impose sanctions that actually hurt the, the people, um, you know, at the bottom of the food chain. And we can do all that here. And so uh, that's one of the reasons I like electric cars. Now, other people like electric cars for a different reason. They, they you know, they believe they're greener. I haven't done the math. Did is my car greener than because they mined some cobalt somewhere and it's handled it? I'm not sure. Yeah. I knew I do know it's cooler and I know it's faster. And I know I can charge it with my house with my solar panels and I don't have to go to the gas station. And that's kind of neat. Um, so I'm I'm excited. I get excited about technology. And I think that's one of the things that can make us more independent. But again, independent, green, sustainable, frugal, um, those overlap. And, and her, you know, the presumption of the new Green Deal is that only government could come up with those oh, solutions. Oh, Matt, and that's, how, many, how many sponsors of the, it's the Green New Deal. I call it the new green deal sometimes too, but I think they call it the green new deal. Yeah, but, I guess that's right. But cause my first tweet, I called it the new green deal, but whatever. Uh, how many of those sponsors of that bill? And I think they've got, I mean, they've almost got every uh, Democrat candidate running for president on it. And they've got most of the house members. That's kind of creepy. They all fell in line like that. Boom. Most of the house members who are Democrats, I think, uh, you know, there's nearly a hundred or more right now that are co-sponsors. How many of them are walking the walk? Do they, do they have solar panels on their house? Is it a token amount? Do they, do they provide like 70 or 80% of their power with solar panels? They're, I think, I've been thinking about this a lot. I think maybe they've got some guilt. They know they're not strong enough to do it on their own. Yeah. So they assume you're not strong enough to do it on your own and that you need some uh, higher power. And they, and they don't, uh, a lot of them don't believe in a higher power. That's neither here nor there. Or they believe the higher power is government, which is why they're so apoplectic about Trump. I mean, they, they prayed to government. Obama was in the pulpit. And, and, and now they, they got an infidel in the pulpit preaching <laughs> like a religion that doesn't even make sense to them. So, uh, which is one of the reasons I like Trump, by the way. He just destroyed their view of government should be the religion and that the high priest is the president. And he somehow got some divine empowerment through our voting for that person. That's all a bunch of... Yeah, they're living a fundamental contradiction now. They, they don't know what to do. They don't know what to do. They're they're apoplectic. But he, let me get back to what I was uh, saying at first, which is they don't believe people are capable of doing the right thing because they're not capable of doing the right thing on their own. Deep inside, they look inside their soul and say, I'm worried. I, I'm not doing the right thing. So we need a government to force us to do the right thing. And I'll run for office and I'll be that government. But how can you be that government if you don't do the right thing yourself? So I, I think you're cutting your colleagues too much slack. I think it's it's more do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> well, that's a simpler way to put it. It is the same reason Barbara Streisand jets around in private jets and all these guys that lecture us about environmental protection. You know, they, they don't follow their own rules um, because, you know, why that, do they get away with that's that? That's for us. Why do they, how are they getting away with that? Why is not MSNBC or CNN calling up every congressional office who sponsors the Green New Deal and saying, does the member, what, what uh, personal responsibility has this member taken? It's a legitimate question. If you're going to force somebody to do something, that, are you willing to do it yourself? Okay, some people have said, and this is true, that creating your own power with solar panels costs more electricity, costs more uh, money yeah. for the same electricity. Well, I happen to know that every member of Congress makes $174,000 a year. 
We all get paid the same. Nancy Pelosi gets a little extra in her paycheck for being the speaker. Like 180, 190, I don't know what it is. She's worth every penny. She is, but she should take that extra money and buy solar panels. Yeah. And anybody making 174, okay, and I, and I know there are a lot of people listening to this who don't make 174 that uh, think about putting solar panels in their house. But you got to ask yourself a question. Why is this person who pretends to be better than me saying that there needs to be a law saying I have to buy this, this kind of electricity, but they're not doing it themselves? And, and I know they make one seventy four. dollars one hundred seventy-four thousand dollars a year. That's a public record. Solar panels retail or retail costs about two dollars and fifty cents a watt. Wholesale price fifty cents a watt. My installed costs about a dollar twenty-five because I do it myself. But even if they had to pay for it themselves, it's two dollars and fifty cents a watt. Like they spend that much on their BMW in a year. Yeah. They still haven't done it on their house for solar panels. I think we have model legislation. I think I think we're going to drop <laughs> drop this bill later this week and. <laughs> And count on you to do that. I, I want to wrap up with with a ridiculous idea I have that was that was uh, triggered last time we were there. We we're we we're out at your farm maybe eighteen months ago now to to film off the grid, and and somewhere like and we had already wrapped up, but uh, we discovered that that you were a competent banjo player. <laughs> I, and I'm, maybe I'm being generous. I mean, you, you were you were plucking, um, but you had been a competent banjo player, and uh, and Rhonda is is a great singer. And and back when you were first getting into politics, you guys used to jam. You used to mm-hmm. do bluegrass jams at local events. Um, I think we need to get the band back together. I would love to do that. Yeah, the, my first political office was county judge executive. There are 120 counties in Kentucky. County judge executive is like the mayor of the county. And uh, I decided in 2010, because I was inspired by Rand Paul in 2010, who was trying to take out the favorite, the golden child, uh, for uh, Senate, U.S. Senate in Kentucky. A Mitch McConnell-blessed candidate. Mitch McConnell had picked the candidate. Yeah. Rand had the audacity to challenge this candidate. Rand's just like an eye doctor in Bowling Green, whose dad's happens to be Ron Paul. I said, you know what? If that eye doctor can run for Senate, I can sure as hell run for county judge executive. So I put my name on the same ballot he was on. The same first election Rand ran for, I was on the same ballot in my county. And I had two bumper stickers on my car. And I put two signs on every barn and two signs in every yard that would take them. Uh, Did the Thomas Massey sign always get slightly better placement <laughs> on, on the barn? I think it looked better. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and it looked a whole lot like the Rand Paul sign. <laughs> Anyways, uh, and and I was inspired to run for that office and um, and did run for it when, when Rand ran. And, um, you know, we both won that day. And that was, uh, that's sort of where the political career started. So you really carried Rand, like Rand rode your coattails, right? That's right. right. <laughs> so without, without, without Thomas Massey running for, for local office, there'd be no Rand Paul. <laughs> well... Yeah, I don't know. I, there are 120 counties in Kentucky, and I campaigned for him in eight. Yeah. And I will say this. He won all eight counties where I was putting up the signs and knocking on the doors. Yeah, you do the math. You, you do, do the, the math. math. Yeah. I, th- I think it was it was uh, instrumental. I was instrumental <laughs> in that. Uh, but in any case. When, when, when Rand is on, we'll ask him if, if he concurs. But at the time, what, what my wife and I did when we were when I was running for county judge executive— and she backed me, you know, 100%. When we weren't knocking on doors, we would go to the country grocery stores and we would advertise a couple weeks in advance we were having a jam session, a bluegrass jam session. Yeah. And um, we would show up and we would pay, play solo. And what I'm saying is there would be like 
a dozen other people show up with their instruments and we would play so low they couldn't hear us <laughs> and it sounded pretty good and when you when you play music together there's a bond i maybe this would work in congress if democrats and republicans could play music together it's hard to hate somebody that you have played music with yeah um it's hard to disrespect them even a little bit after you played music with them so my wife and i we went um, to a, a, a barbecue place, and we would we would play music there, and we would play in these country stores, and 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 people would show up, and just just for the fun of it. And um, I guess maybe part of what endeared me to them is I wasn't that good. Yeah, <laughs> they were like, "Hey, this guy's willing to try." <laughs> He's willing to make an ass out of himself. That's right. He'll let's, do it for us. Let's let's send him to the to the head office. Right. Okay, we're going to do that, and uh, you need to recruit a few more players to, okay. to cover up so I can play any solo again. Potential fall solo, flaws you can't that hear you me. might. Yeah, and uh, that that'll be a forthcoming movie in 2020. That sounds good. Do you have a name for this movie? Um, I, you know, it's not a good name, and we're going to have to come up better. But I, I, I view it as, as sort of a Liberty Jam session. Liberty Jam session. Um, and I love bluegrass music, and I, I. I fundamentally agree with your your there's a sense of community that comes out of music and playing together it, it sort of strips away all the the political bs that sometimes gets us distracted yeah well let's do it um it'll be a lot of fun you bring the beer i'll provide the beef i'll play cowbell <laughs> we need more cowbell thank you sir thank you matt Thanks for watching Kibbe on Liberty. By now, you know this is the most important event of your week. So make sure you subscribe on YouTube. Click the little bell so you get notifications. Kibbe on Liberty, mostly honest conversations with mostly interesting people.